joining me now on the next film school podcast. Uh, first time guest, although not the first time I've talked to this gentleman, I was honored uh, to be a guest of his. Uh, I guess it was uh, last weekend or two ago to talk a little yeah, less basketball. Two weekends ago. Two up. weekends yeah. ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll do that again soon. But for now, I get him for a little bit longer than he had me, which I'm very excited about. He is the weekend sports anchor for New York Post Sports and SNY um, doing all of their TV video content. He also has a couple of podcasts, um, the NBA Exchange, in which he obviously talks NBA basketball and Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. Um, I want to talk about both of those. Sure. My, my man, Dexter Henry, how are you? I'm, I'm good, man. I'm good, uh, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. It was great when you came on with me at SMI New York Post. We had a lot of fun. We, we'll do something longer next time, Matt. We'll definitely do something longer, but uh, it was good. And you, you'll absolutely be back. You're going to be on multiple times this season, for sure. It, you, you know because you've been in the game now for almost 20 years, right? Like in various Yeah, formats. I've been... I've been doing this for uh, 17 years. That makes me feel old, but yes, 17 years professionally. Yeah. Dude, I'm, I'm on the verge of a 40th birthday, uh, which is to say the next birthday will be 40. So I, that will be me next year. Next year, my birthday will be 40. Too, we, so there you go. We talked about this. So like, you don't, don't got to talk to me about feeling old. Um, no, but like, it's always interesting when you do, whether it's writing or, or if for like, like, you know, speaking or whatever, when you, are used to flexing your muscles in one way and then you got to like completely shift it up. But like, you're probably better at that than anyone by, by this point. Cause you've been, you've done a, you've done it all at this point. Yeah. I've done a lot, man. Started my career in print, um, then moved to TV and, you know, doing podcasting. And so always talking and, um, listening, watching other people do stuff too. It's where I get a lot of inspiration from as well. So yeah, I've been doing it for a while. It doesn't, feel like that though Jonathan I know you probably feel the same way that time just flies by it doesn't feel that way but yeah I've definitely like you said I've definitely uh honed my craft doing a lot of work and and also doing a lot of it independently um and you know that's why I'm a big fan of you know what you guys do at Nick's Film School um because I, how I got my start is a lot of doing my own stuff so that's why I always love to support other independent content creators especially what you guys do so well so yeah, man, that's, you know, I told you that I told you that personally when we had talked before, yeah. but um, yeah, it's just a great way to hone your craft and it should be an inspiration to other people out there. Right. You know, if you want to work on creating your own content and getting it out there, um, it's the best way you you have to hone your craft It's yours. So nothing's better than that. I, I feel, you know, like I've been at the, this in some way, shape or form, not nearly as long as you, I would say probably five or five or six years, something like that. So I I'm curious because when you got into it originally back in like 2005 mm -hmm. there like new media, like there was no new media that, that was, not, that was not a term that was like yeah. really around yet. So yeah. like, I feel like you, did you have to like, cause now, you know, like the, all of your different hats that you wear, like to me, you're the, you're as bright shining an example of new media as there is like, cause you, you, you fill all these different boxes and you get at people in so many different ways. Did you feel like you had to adjust like to get, used to doing things a different way. You're just kind of like, yeah. I think what you're asking is a great question. And I think, so when I graduated college in 2005 from the university of Pittsburgh, I, I, it was a very interesting time. As you said, things were shifting already. But, yeah, it was, but I think not everybody saw it. Right. Um, like if, so, so I, see I would, the signs. <laughs> yeah, I, I, t I tell the, I tell this story sometimes to people and I'll, t I'll share it here. Yeah. So, in 2007, I actually worked for the New York Post before as a video journalist. And that's actually where I got a lot of my start doing stuff on camera. Okay. And one of my first assignments was I was covering um, the Giants when they're about to go on their playoff run. When they won, when they won that championship, they just beat the Pats uh, to end the undefeated season or attempt that they had at the undefeated season when they were eight, 18, you know, 17, 16 and one, excuse me, 15 and one. And. Yeah, well, they tried to beat him. Excuse me, sorry, I'm forgetting how it went. They beat him in the Super Bowl, obviously, and that's what they, I, well, no, because they played him the last week of the they season. They played him last week of the season. Close game. It was a close game. They yes, played him really well. Game. I remember that. So I was there, and you know, I'm 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 there, and I'm doing that. And so the next week, um, I'm forgetting who the Giants played in their first game on the road. I want to say it was Tampa, but I could be wrong about that. It was Tampa. Andrew was okay. confirming it as Tampa. It was Tampa. Andrew's confirmed it was Tampa. Okay, so my memory's not that bad. Um, so it's Tampa and I go to this press conference that they're having before the game and you know, Eli is speaking and blah, blah, blah. And I go there and I got 
little camera, little mic. You got to remember, this is 2005. So all the stations were the big networks are there. And they're looking at me coming up with my small camera. <laughs> and they're like, what is going on here? And this was just the start. The post was just starting doing video online. And this okay. guy who works for he worked for Fox, he says to me, he said, you think this is going to last? video on the web? No, I don't think it's going to last. It's going to be, it's just a fad. It's a thing that's, you know, coming by. And I'm like, what are you talking about, man? I already could see where it was going. You know, it was 2007. I, I didn't have an iPhone. I have an iPhone now, but I had a, it was a Blackberry. I was starting to watch a lot of video online. YouTube was in, I think, three years old. You could see where it was going if you were, I feel like, young enough. And I was young enough to see that, that, hey, video online is going to be a thing. This is obviously pre-Twitter and pre-Instagram. That's a couple of years away. But it's wild that you... Yeah, I can see it. Good job by you having that foresight, man. Yeah. Well, you know what? Good job, too, by like the New York Post at that time. They mm-hmm. invested in video at the time. It didn't work out the way I think they thought it would then. But they at least put their foot in it. And I think you could start to see the possibilities. Obviously, after that, Mac, you Twitter and Instagram, though, that explodes everything else. So I kind Twitter of was what, what changed everything for like that's yes. when I when I realized like, oh, there's this. Ad, and I'm again, I'm so behind the times when anything comes out like five or 10 years later, that's when I'll get yeah. in on it. So like I joined Twitter in 2016. I'm like, wait a minute. So I could like write something and then tweet it out and like theoretically, you know, like Bill Simmons or Zach Lowe could like see what I like. That's OK. I can work with this. <laughs> yeah. And I'll, I'll 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 just say share this other thing really quickly, how it how it evolved into me doing my own thing. So in 2010, I started my production company, Backpack Broadcasting, yes. which I do a lot of my shows through. And that was really because one of my mentors and my cousin, who I give a lot of credit, shout out to my cousin, Makeda. She was like, you can do your own thing and put your own videos. And I was covering a lot of high school sports here in Brooklyn. and getting it out there. And that's really kind of what got myself out there was like, Hey, doing these videos, putting it on YouTube, tweeting them out. And that was it. And I think it was, like you said, it was kind of being a little more forward thinking on that and not waiting for some other company or some institution to sort of give me the opportunity and, and sort of just taking it myself. I mean, I've been open and honest about this in, in the past. Like when I started doing, even when Andrew first came aboard, I told him, I'm like, yeah, man, you know, if, if some, if, you know, such and such company comes knocking on my door, I'm like, I'll probably peace out. Right. Because like this, this is cute what we're doing, but like, it's, you know, you know, what are we, what are we really doing here? And now how many years later, it's like, Oh, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah. You know, it's uh, it's crazy how it, how it's really evolved and, and you've been involved, uh, been evolving along with it. Yeah. Which leads me to you were at the Knicks fan TV uh, party. At the, I was. Yes. Yeah, I, was and I, saw, I saw some of the video from that. Yeah. Um, I, it's first of all, again, it's so cool that like a like Nick fan TV is a fan gener- It's all about the fans is getting that kind of publicity and awesome by you to be there. Yeah. Um, how was it? What was it? What was the vibe? So there? it was great. First of all, shout out to CP and JD and Alex and all those guys. I uh, love what they do too independently. Um, and it's funny. CP had reached out to me to send me an invite to come. I was just going to go as a regular spectator. I wasn't even going to work. And then the, the day before he hit me up and said, hey, could you guys come and sort of cover it? I said, all right, let me talk to my boss. So I hit my boss up. They were like, yeah, we think it's a really good idea. It would be nice to talk to some Knicks fans, get the vibe of, you know, before the season starts. So that's what we did. We just went out there, you know, talked to CP and the guys, talked to some fans. The energy was good. <laughs> it was great. Seemed um, like it. It was good to see uh, Knicks Nation pumped up. A lot of interesting fans to talk to, as there always are when Knicks fans come together. So, there's a, there's so, a lot good, of us, so, you know, different, yeah. different personalities are bound to different, a lot of different personalities, John, a lot of different personalities. But it was fun, man. I, I had a good time. It was good talking to the fans. I don't think I had been out to a fan event like that for quite some time since, like, the, you know, the pandemic. And so yeah. it was really nice to, you know, connect with Nick fans again and, you know, come out and support CP and those guys. And, I'm um, seeing what they're doing and, you know, independent content creators got to support each other. So I always love doing that. It's always good. It was cool to see. So you you kind of answered the question already, but transitioning into this year's team, I, I was like, I don't even know if I want to say I was cautiously optimistic about the season. I, I, it hit me as I was approaching each of the first three games last season left so much scarring on my soul, Dexter, that like, 
I was like a happy go lucky, you know, going, you know, after the, the we here season, like starting last year. And then slowly it became this thing where it's like, oh, my God, this is painful. This is like not a fun thing. Did you get a sense from the vibe for the first game that like fans had were just like ready to move on? Or do you did you get some of that same like trepidation? Like, are, are we going to be able to get past whatever last season was? Yeah, I got this sense of we've moved on. Um the hives that exist, the OB hive, the Cam Reddish hive, those that exist are very strong. I get, let me, when let did me this tell happen? You. When did, <laughs> when did, hi, like, I, don't know. I, I, I hear, wait, watch this. I'm yeah. young enough to remember when you rooted for your team and just like, that was it. You had a favorite right. player, right? you know, but it's like, now it's all hives anyway. Yeah, they're, they're, the hives are real. They're, they're really well, they're, out there. And they're real. You know, as I was going around 4040 and talking to different people and watching the games in different spots, you know, uh, listen, anything that Obi did, a lot of cheers, right? And I know you guys know about how some fans want Julius up out of here and they want Obi to get more playing time. You guys have talked about it. I've I've watched, you've written about it. I've I've read um and Cam Reddish. There was a guy standing next to me who I was with for most of the probably most of the fourth quarter. And he kept saying every shot that Cam hit, that's my boy. I told you, that's my boy. I told you he's going to perform. You got to give him more time. So anytime he did something, he just turned to me. He's like, you see, you see. I, I, it's like, I never said Cam couldn't play, man. It wasn't me. I didn't say that. But yeah, but the, <laughs> the, nice the, thing vibes, the vibes were good, John. The vibes were good. good. And I think people have moved on and they're optimistic. And the re- last, I'll let you go in a second. I'm yeah. sorry. But the thing I think they're really optimistic about is Jalen Brunson. Okay. That was a consistent thing I heard, which was, Brunson's here. We, we feel like we have a point guard. We think it can make a lot of things better. And, you know, so far, it's three games, small sample size. But I th- and the preseason, I, as we talked about, yeah. I think you're seeing some of the fruits of that. And so I understand why the fan base is excited in that way. I, I said it after the Orlando game, which was last night as we're recording this. I 1000% think they lose that game if Jalen Brunson is. is I, saw, I saw your tweet on that and I think I liked it and I agree with you. I agree yeah. with you. I, he's just, you know, it's, but it, it's like, the, it doesn't, not that it annoys me, but every, everybody's like, oh, the Knicks have a fi- finally have a point guard. The Knicks finally have a point guard. The way the league is today, oftentimes the player who is dependable in those spots is the point guard because of the way the rules have evolved and it's, you know, it's a three point shooting league and the whole thing. They just need someone who can reliably get them a bucket and get them a sound possession at the end of a game when defense is tightened up. It, you know, again, I'll, there are a lot of point guards who fill that role and Jalen Brunson is one of them. But that's to me where it really what it comes down to, because like the year before they had Alfred Payton to point guard. I don't want to disparage Alfred Payton. Right. Um, you know, and then obviously Derek Rose came in. But a lot of the end of game stuff, it wasn't all Derek Rose. Like there was a lot of like going through Julius and Julius was hitting shots. That's what changed last season. But I agree with you. I think Brunson is, is all the difference. Oh, yeah, I, I, I think he's all the difference. And look, I'll, I'll be honest. Um you know, when I first heard the reports about them signing Brunson, I was kind of on the fence about it, you know, but then I thought about it more and I looked at what they signed him for and, you know, how much that cost and where he's paid among starting point guards in the league, which is probably about what he is. Average. Yeah. He's average. Paid average. Yeah. Now, look, if he plays outplays the contract, which you can argue to some degree already he has, Right. If he can continuously does that, always borderline all star level, well, then the Knicks got themselves a steal. And look, yeah. the cap's going to go up. <laughs> we know this in a couple of years. The cap's going to go up. So it's going to end up being a bargain if he continues to play at this level where he's not turning over the ball, because that's one of the most impressive things to me. He's not turning yes. over the ball. He's still very efficient uh, hitting shots, especially in the mid range. You saw last night again. I know we're recording this, but last night when he played, when they played Orlando, they, the lead gets down to I believe it was six, uh, six. Yep. and he hits that mid range shot and gets fouled, gets to and one, and just how crafty he was, and to be somebody that can actually get that shot, yes. you know he's not going to turn the ball over, or at worst he's going to find somebody else for a better shot. If you're a Nick fan, that's a play where you got to be encouraging. That to me is the moment that what you're talking about, Mac, and the fact that yes, they would they would have lost that game. It would have been a poor possession turnover, missed shot, not a quality possession, but the fact that he can hit that shot is huge. And and I think like, you know, I do this a lot where, uh, uh, you know, fans will be like, you know, run your stuff. It shouldn't come down to one-on-one. It shouldn't come down to ISO. But meanwhile, you turn on any game 
in the last five, 10 minutes of a close game, like, te- like teams, the stuff that they usually run oftentimes goes out the window. It's like, yep. it, who's your guy? Who's my guy? You know, what, what can they get us? Um, who could bend the defense to their will? And, and Brunson certainly is doing that so far. I, I agree with you. I think the conversation about his contract is over. And actually, you know, the Knicks, Brunson, Mitchell Robinson, Isaiah Hartenstein, three signings this summer, th- money they spent. I think all three look great. So, so for as much as, yep. you know, maybe the Donovan Mitchell trade, how it went down was like a little weird, um, you know, looking and trying to judge the front office from that. I think the money they spent is good. I want to get back to Cam. <laughs> um, what do you think happens here? Because we just got word uh, two hours before we started recording this. that Quentin Grimes is going to miss another game. Yep. I'm starting because like I initially was like, oh, they're just going to keep Grimes out until, you know, someone else gets hurt. And like then could like to avoid this rotation question. And now with every increasing game, he, he's out. I'm like, is this like a real issue? Mm-hmm. And then but then I think back, well, if they, he comes back, then what happens to camp? What do you think is going to happen with this? If you had to guess? Well, th- the first thing I'll say is I'm starting to wonder if it is a worse injury. That's than yeah. what we may have been led to believe or or and because they're being very cautious, with, which is fine. I'm fine with them being as cautious with Grimes as they possibly can. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing, Mac. <laughs> it's three games. Yep. Cam has looked good in two of them. He looked decent against the Magic. Yep. He was really good against the Grizzlies for half. For half. Yes. Yes. <laughs> for half. First half for was half. so great. Let's not, let's not go crazy. He's really good for half. Um, I am not, look, I'll be honest. I'm out on Cam Wretch. I've been out on Cam Wretch, right? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You I've been putting out, it out there. Okay. The, Cam, the Cam Hive is not going to be happy with me, but I've been out on Cam Reddish. Here's my, when I say out, I want to clarify. Yeah. Do clarify. I think he has potential? Because I saw Andrew just perked up. He's like, I got to see what Dexter and Do he's I think getting the that- clip ready for social. He's, all, he's, all <laughs> he's getting ready. He's like, uh-oh. Um, do I think he has potential? Yes. I think a lot of it is, can he be, and he's looked a little better. Can he play in Tibbs' defensive schemes? Is he not going to miss his assignment on rotations? Is he going to take quality shots with the shot selection? Lately, it's looked like that. Here's what it comes down to, because you asked me what it comes down to, Mac. All right, here's your moment. Grimes is, Grimes is out. This is your time to shine. Either you get the job done or you do not, right? It's really simple as that. Do I think he can? Sure, he can. He's got the tools. He's a talented player. If he does it, I think it, this is his last chance right here. You got to get it done. You got the chance. Andrew, I know you want to say something. Go ahead. John, just can I ask a quick question? You can ask as many questions as you'd like. Dexter, <laughs> yes. why, do you, why do you hate Cam Reddish? No, I don't hate Cam Reddish. Don't try to get in trouble. I don't hate Cam Reddish. <laughs> I a, don't it, hate him. Don't t- we should tell him it's a bit. <laughs> it's a bit. Anytime I'll, you have a mild amount you, of criticism toward a player. Oh, I got you. We got react you. on behalf of the overly sensitive. The overly Twitter sensitive mob. fans. And, yes. and overly sensitive Why do you hate R.J. You? Barrett for pointing out his blatant career stats of inefficiency? You know? You know, you know what? We, we're in this... And I'd like to say it's the first time I probably talked about this on a podcast, but I'd say it's when it's time with team stuff where fans, some fans, I won't say all fans, some fans are really sensitive. And I, it kind of annoys me where I'm like, look, I grew up a Knicks fan. Mm-hmm. Die are a Knicks fan. I grew up a Knicks fan. Sometimes you're going to like some players on the team. Sometimes you're not. And sometimes it's rooted in fact, right? Like they're not performing well. I had no problem with people criticizing Julius Randle last year when he did not perform well. And then he booed the fans. I think some fans took it a little bit too personally. I wasn't that bothered when he gave the thumbs down, but some people did. And the criticism exists. But if somebody criticizes one player in the team, it doesn't mean I'm, I don't like the player at all. Like out of this. I said I'm out on Cam because in the time he's coming, he hasn't shown me. And I don't think Tibbs liked him that much. It wasn't that I high agree. on him. I actually, I actually know that Tibbs is not that, wasn't that high on him, right? Mm-hmm. Like He hasn't been that high on him. And a lot of it was because of defense. Now, he's made the most of his opportunity here early in the season. But let's see, he's got an opportunity, I think, to answer Jonathan's question. I think this could play out where, and I think what you're trying to lead to it, Jonathan, I want to put words in your mouth. It's, no, right, please. If Cam plays well, does he take Grimes' spot in the rotation I when Grimes so. comes back? You don't think so, right? I don't think so because I think Tibbs, look, I'm a, one of the preeminent Tom Thibodeau supporters. I wear the hat proudly. It is what it is. I, I, 
Let's get talk. Why to you do you sometimes. hate other coaches, John? Why do you hate other coaches? <laughs> <laughs> no, what it is is why do you hate our young players? Because you because you can't support Tom Thibodeau and and support the young players. I think that's where I get in. Can I ask you a question? Sure. I, I mean, do you believe that the narrative is actually real about Tom Thibodeau hating young players? Because I no. think there's enough proof that it's not real. When you look at what he did in Chicago with the young core he had there and how he's played guys like Grimes quickly. Well, what, RJ, what I think about Tom and I, I it, it's funny. It took me. I don't think I ever actually came out and like said it. So, so directly last season, because I was just so I was too far in the in the forest to see the trees or whatever. It, it like crystallized for me if maybe a few weeks before this year started the season started where Tom Thibodeau likes certainty. And I think most coaches hmm. like certainty. They like the sure if there are two possibilities and, the, and one possibility maybe has a slightly higher ceiling, but the other possibility is a higher floor. I think most coaches in the NBA, at least, I don't maybe other sports as well, will go with the higher floor option. And I think Tom believes so much in his system in terms of defensive system. And it's like, if you get me the talent on offense, I'm going to do what I'm going to do and I'm going to get you a lot of wins. And by the way, you know, two seasons, he had great teams in Chicago, like best winning percentage in the league for those two years. But I digress. I think mm-hmm. that's and I think with Grimes. The reason you're always going to see Grimes gets minutes is the floor there is high because he's dependable on defense and he's, we think, probably going to knock down shots on offense. With Obi, like, yeah, there's this fun world that we all like to live in sometimes. It's like, oh, imagine what he could do with 30, 35 minutes. I mean, I talk about it all the time. And like, what could that offense look like? Like, boy, wouldn't that be fun? But it's an uncertainty. And the reality of it is like the floor with Obi is also lower because of the things that maybe he's not as, as sure thing, which leads me back to cam. Yep. And I think it's fascinating. And I think it's a fascinating test case because Tom may be stubborn, but he's not stupid. And he knows that if this dude hits and keeps growing and keeps getting better, well, that's a game changer for his job security or, you know, prospects that like to where he's going to take this Nick team, because like they just don't make that many players who are whatever he is, six, eight to, you know, and can move like that and has those skills. I'm fascinated by it. I don't, I don't know who goes out of the rotation. I, I was saying last night, would it shock you if Fournier was like a healthy scratch? What, like if Grimes is back, like, would that shock you? I mean, it would it shock me. In fact, I might say this. I think it would be the right move. I would argue. It it actually, it actually would be the right move, right? I don't know if it's going to happen, but if you see enough, Let's say let's say Grimes comes back second week in November. I have no knowledge of this. Please do not say that I'm reporting this. I'm just throwing aggregators this out. get your you know how the aggregators do. Let's say he comes back second week in November, right, guys? And Reddish to that point is played well. He looks competent on defense, been knocking down some shots, playing well in a good role off the bench. And Fournier, who's not been, he's been meh. He's been Evan Fournier. Yeah, he's been Evan Fournier. Like, I, I'm not mad at it. I'm not hating on it because then you're going to get people out there saying, why do you hate Evan Fournier? Um, why do you hate Evan Fournier? I, I, I just hate I just hate all the players. <laughs> um, but let's say that happens. And you're and, and Tom Thibodeau, let's say Tom Thibodeau, an organization makes a decision to say, hey, you know what? We're going with Grimes. We're going with Reddish here. I don't want to hear from the Knicks fans saying that they're not in on the young players, which I also think has just never really been true. Right. Like I've never really bought into that. Tibbs hates the young players. I've never bought into that completely. If that happens and they go in the direction, I think it's the best direction for the team. If it's, it's, it's allowing the team to build with the young core and giving them some versatility because you have options where you can play Cam at the three. You can play him at the four sometimes, depending on what happens. There's a yep. lot of switchability with him, especially if he buys into the defense and we see what's good for him. So yes, if that move to happen, Jonathan, I would be in full support of it. And listen, I don't think any of us really hate Evan Fournier. We're just like, like if you could drive him to the airport tomorrow and to get him up out of here for a trade, most people probably would. The the thing I, I agree. What I wonder is whether the front office would like if a team called them tomorrow and to be very clear, I don't think any team is calling them (laughs) with this tomorrow (laughs) and being like, we'll give you. And the, the other part of it, there's not that many of these contracts out there, mm-hmm. what I'm about to say, but like, we'll give you this 
expiring contract of veteran X who is not like will come to your team and is not going to be deserving a rotation spot for the remainder of Evan Fournier's deal. Um, do I think the Knicks would just say, all right, fine. We'll, we will, we will give you this player who is a undisputably better player than what you are giving back to us. It's not even going to get us in a cap room this summer. Hell you could say, you know, a, a guy with like two years left on his deal um, just to get off the money, just to get him out of here. I, I wonder whether the front office would do that, which kind of gets back to a critique I had of them over the summer, which is like, it seems like there's different people rowing in different directions and there's a, mm-hmm. a lack of a cohesive vision, but I, I don't know. I wonder if they would do that. And the other thing, you know, to be fair to Evan Fournier, he's still the best shooter on the team, right? Like that's still the thing. You, and the Knicks are not like they have a they're dearth not of shooting. Yeah. No. They're not like chock full of shooting no. on the roster here. Um, and so that's something I would worry about. Now, look, if you believe that Grimes is the guy that can get out there and hit the shots and, you know, let's not go crazy about what we saw in summer league this year. Although I like, I'm a guy, I like Grimes. Okay. I was drinking all the Kool-Aid. Yeah. 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 I, I like Grimes. I'm high on Grimes. I, I, I like it. I like his two way ability. Um, and so all that, I, look, here's the other thing too, though, that we have to think about if Reddish continues to play well. Well, it's only good for the organization because now his value goes up. Yeah. Just the, in the offseason, everybody was like, well, you can't move Reddish. There's nothing you could do there. Well, now he's another asset because he's been getting some burn and people are seeing what he can do. And if he plays at a better level, it just only helps the Knicks in for that. And I'm sure we'll probably get into this, the next future star that everybody thinks well, is going to come a bit rumored to the Knicks. Let's, yeah, let's let's get into that now because you, as you, as I said, you host... Um, a general NBA podcast as well. Yeah. So I, I, I was excited because I knew I could talk to you. Um, about NBA, other things, yes. <laughs> yes, about other things. Uh, NBA Exchange, by the way. Everybody go check that out. Um, I find the beginning to this season very interesting in that, like, even before the year started, I think you, you know, and shout out, you know, Zach Lowe has said this on his pod, um, like, God help these teams that are trying to win that lose to any of these, you know, your San Antonio's, mm-hmm. your Utah's, your, you know, go down the list. And guess what? There's already been a bunch of those sorts of instances. And like when there's so many teams trying to win, it gives me the sense that this might be one of the wilder and wackier years in the NBA with lots of like unexpected stuff. I'm approaching this to the point that you just made the question you just raised, like, Nothing would surprise me in terms of like, if you gave me the name of like player X is like, Oh, player X is unhappy. I mean, some guys, obviously you're, you're going to be like, no, that's, that's not possible. But like, there's mm-hmm. a lot of, there's a lot of situations out there that I th- already you could keep an eye on. Yeah. I mean, we can go right down to I-95 I, to Philly. I was waiting to see if you were going to take the And, uh, <laughs> you know, listen, I'm not, listen, I, and I've watched all of their games this season, at least most of all their games this season. And, Look, if things don't get right there, Embiid could say, look, I've been through the process. You guys got me hardened. This isn't working. We know about the, the I, I still am not sold that in my hometown of Brooklyn, that everything is okay uh, over there. Uh, ha- still- can I ask you? Uh, sure. uh, sorry. I, so you cover the Nets and the Knicks because you're, you know, you're the weekend guy and yep. both teams. Like, if they are not good, or let me rephrase that, they're, they'll be, they won't be bad. But like if they're if they're like eh, right? Like what does does he demand to trade again? Like what happens? Well, see that's see that's that's a great question there, Jonathan. Because you know <laughs> I never bought into the fact that okay, Katie demanded to trade, and pretty much I think this is something that I've talked about before. But it kind of got this spin to the story, and I hate putting it like this. They're like, oh, they've worked everything out, and I'm like. No, what happened here is Joe Sy was like, look, I got all the leverage and you don't. <laughs> it's it's really that simple, right? Like, it's not that deep. It, it, we're not, it's not that deep here. And so, um, I, look, if things are, I, I could see this. What is, sh- look, put it like this. Would it shock you? I feel like I'm answering your question with a question. No, it's kind of general. I don't think it would shock anybody if they were blah, meh, whatever you want to say. And it's mid to late January. And you start hearing rumors of a trade request again. 
especially when there are concerns. When I was watching their game, I've watched all their games as well, too, because I'm an NBA junkie. I'm watching all their games, and they have defensive issues. Ben Simmons won't shoot the ball, which I think is a problem. It's, I've been saying it's a problem. In, in the and, National Basketball Association, where the goal is to... Yes, <laughs> the goal is to score. <laughs> the ball yes. Is the basket. yes, it's a slight problem. Look, the, the, point, the point being to all of this, right, to whether you're talking about Brooklyn or Philly, or I'm now trying to scan and think of another team where somebody... Well, the Lakers, they've got their own dysfunction there, right? I'm, I mean, yeah, we, we haven't talked about it yet. That's... I mean, and Russ, we should talk about a recent injury report. Apparently, Russell Westbrook is doubtful for there. I find uh, that in, I find that injury in, injury interesting. I'll say that. Find it's it interesting. one word for it. Um, <laughs> yeah, but like there's, you know, and I think it, but it does. I think we're, we, we've asked so many questions about, and we, we talked about it on this pod a lot, like player empowerment and like, what are the limits to it? Are there limits? And, you know, so on and so forth. I, it's going to be really interesting because the other thing about Durant, like with LeBron, like these guys are old or older, right? Older, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like they're young, young guys. So like how, how much pressure, you know, does that change how much pressure they could exert? Like, again, we don't really know the answers to these questions. Yeah. It's, it's all interesting. I mean, you also could look at obviously Shea Gilders, Alexander's another name that's been brought up with the Knicks uh, with OKC and they're playing. How much longer does he want to be part of that rebuilding situation where there's a lot of losing uh, there's a lot going on. Chicago, DeMar DeRozan, uh, you know, if Delonzo Ball doesn't come back this year and where they are, it, it, there's a lot of interesting stuff. And you never, you're right, with this year being so tight, I can see the yeah. trade deadline being insane. With there being a lot of competition, you don't know how things are going to go. And I was, I heard Zach Lowe's podcast when he made that point. You lose a bad game, you lose a game to a some projected bad team early yeah. in the year where you're trying to do something. It's, going to be a concern. I even talked about this with the Knicks last night. I was concerned about this week. Oh my looking God. at the Knicks. I said, you, you've seen this before, guys. Early game in the season that the Knicks should win and they don't win, right? Orlando comes in. Charlotte's coming in uh, on Wednesday night. Been playing well. Been, playing, been playing, well, playing well. But you think it's a game they should win. After that, they have seven games in a row against teams who have at least made the playing tournament last year. So, you would think they, they, they need to take care of business against the teams they should. But, we've you know, a letdown early in the season, the way you're saying it's going to be competitive, Jonathan, I agree with you. It could, it could change a lot. It could change a lot for you in the standings. The way I expect the East and West to be bunched up, it could change a lot. It's, it's funny because, like, you know, maybe we'll finish up with this. Is like we, in the NBA, it, it, we've gotten to this point where, and I don't think wrongly, you either want to be at the top or you want to be at the, the very, very bottom. And obviously there are teams who will probably try very hard to be at the very bottom sooner rather than later. And then there's a bunch of teams going for it. Like you don't want to be in the middle. And right now the Knicks are squarely in the middle. I think the way to put a positive spin on that is when you add in the additional part of it that so many of these other teams, like you're talking about, we talked about Philly, we talked about uh, Brooklyn, we talked about the Lakers. Um, all of these teams all of their picks are out the window. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, the Knicks may be at the middle in the middle, but they have all, they still have all their assets at their disposal, but uh, at, at their disposal, they, they did not go all in. So it's like, I almost feel like there is a value to maintaining that, you know, be around 500, be a little bit above 500 because then you could at least continue to be an attractive destination and then use those assets. Now, is it going to be the right trade? Is it going to be the right player? We'll see. But like to get back to your point that you just made, there's a reason I'm sitting here sweating out the the magic game. And like, you know, <laughs> I'll be like, I'll be looking at the Hornets game like, yeah, we got to win this game. Cause I'm not, I don't know, maybe some fans look, look at this like, yeah, it doesn't matter. They're not winning anything anyway this year. I think this is important. I think it's important for them to maintain a level of competency this year. And that is why I think in its own weird way, this is a really important year for for the franchise. I completely agree. It's also why I wasn't terribly upset when they didn't land Donovan Mitchell. I believe in sports, there's something to continuity and building of culture. And yes, last year was a down year for the Knicks, but I think it's the third year of a lot of these guys playing together, playing in this system, right? Mm -hmm. And some of the younger guys that we've talked about, and I think it matters. I think you're seeing it now. They had the defensive identity in the we're here year. Last year, they lost some of it because they had Campbell Walker and Evan Fournier starting starting backcourt, and that didn't help. 
But now we have a competent point guard in Jalen Brunson. You've got guys moving the ball. That's been one of the most impressive things to oh, me yes. in the, in, with the Knicks early on in the season. I think it was before last night's game. They were leading the league in assist to turnover ratio as a team. This has been wildly impressive to watch how they're moving the ball. The ball's not sticking to Julius Randle. It's not sticking to any guy. And you can see how they're all buying in, guys. You can see it. Now, what do they do when they play upper echelon teams consistently in a row? We'll see. Because they've only played one in Memphis. We'll see what happens there. But I think you're right, man. There's a lot to... If Here's the thing. If you're going to be in the middle, what they call NBA purgatory, which some people will argue that's what the Knicks are, if you're going to be there, you know where you want to be there? With some young players and some assets. Yeah. That's what you, you don't want to be in the middle when your cupboard's there. That's what you don't want to do. But when you've got some stuff in the cupboard, now you can start cooking if an opportunity comes well, up. That, and, that, yeah. That's what made the, the, um, talk about going back a few, few years, the Scott Layden Nick so depressing because like oh, that, man. those were like, you know, <laughs> high 30s, whatever, win teams. And it's like yep. there's no young talent to speak of that. But then it gets back to what we started talking about at the beginning, which is like, there's that's why these hives are there. And that's why there are people out there who are like, unless this player plays a certain number of minutes, like not that I don't care, but like it's going to sully what otherwise would be a good win. And I, I, I get that. I do get that sentiment because again, they are trying to have their cake and eat it too. And that's not, that's not easy. Um, you know, but you talk about vibes, you talk about cultures, talk about all that stuff. Like everybody has to believe that the coach is doing everything he can to win games, right? Like that's, that's ultimately why I always defend Thibodeau. Cause I think everything he does, everybody in the locker room, they may not agree with him, but I think they believe that he believes everything he's doing is like in the, in the best interest of winning. And I don't know if that matters, but that's yeah. my, my thing. Yeah. I mean, I, you and I are on the same page with that. And the thing I always, I say to other fans who talk to me about this and people I've encountered is, have you heard anything coming out from the young players saying that they don't like Tibbs? Or have you heard anybody crying about minutes? No, we haven't heard this at all. And this even comes from beat writers and people around the team that I've spoken to about this and other people I know around the team. No, that's not the case. This is actually a very good locker room with a very good culture. Um, and so you, you're not hearing that. And I think those things are positive. I just think somebody who's grown up a Nick fan and still roots for this team, I think there's just so much pain and scarring for a lot of fans that Anything that happens, they're like, oh, man, this is going to be bad. Right. Like that's real, though. Of, I, I, yeah. And I get that, too, though. Yeah. I can't kill those fans. I, I, I get it. I I'm one of those fans sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> man, you, know? Yeah, you and I, you and I being of the same age, yeah. you know, we grew up watching these 90s Knicks and love those teams yeah. and how hard they played. And. You know, I think what if you if you're a Nick fan that really wanted this team to be good, I think what you probably wanted to see, which I, which I actually believe we've been seeing over the last two plus years, is that you're seeing a culture develop and an identity develop. And I'm hoping that that turns into something really good. So am I, um, you know, and and I think the coach has a little something to do with that, that culture. Just, I'll, I'll get one more compliment in there to, to talk to him. Got to. Had to. Andrew's probably going to cut that in post. Totally. And I'm going <laughs> to cut it together with you saying something derogatory about it is probably. Um, Dexter, can I actually ask a question? Yeah, John and sure. I were talking earlier today um, with Benji, uh, Ben Ritholtz, who does yeah. a lot of film work for us. And yep. we were discussing the idea of hives. Like that's come up a couple of times, obviously, throughout this conversation. And seeing as how you've been online as long as you have, do you think it's always been like this or is this a new phenomenon? I know you mentioned that we're more sensitive than we used to. And I think the internet in general with having opinions and making sure they're heard is more active, but like, were we like this? Cause I remember the Alonzo Trier hives. I remember the Damian Dotson hives. Yeah. I go back as far as the Landry Fields hives. I was I part was, of the Landry Fields hive. I was part of that. Hive. We were all well, part of that. Hive. Well, I was part of the go get Carmelo Anthony hive. So I was in a different world where I wanted the guy. Right. So has it always been like this? Yeah. I think it's always been like this. Right. I just think it's, Social media has amplified it. So it, it, it seems a little bit louder than what it is. Right. Like I even I even remember my dad when I was watching games with my dad growing up. My dad was always like, why don't they give this guy more minutes? Why isn't Rolando Blackman getting more minutes? Why isn't Anthony Bonner? Everybody is always in love with the guy that's not getting burned. It's kind of like the backup quarterback right. in the NFL. Yeah. 
right? Like everybody's in love with it. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be because sometimes you're right. But I do think there's this element. And I wonder, Jonathan, I wonder how both you guys feel about it. There's still this element, I think, around a lot of fans that, well, I'm smarter than Tibbs. I'm smarter than this coach. I'm smarter than that coach. And that element exists out there. And sometimes I'm like, look, man, there are some terrible coaches out there. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> there, there are. But a guy like Tibbs, as Jonathan mentioned before, who's had a proven track record, who you've seen do a lot of things. And I think people ignore a lot of the development that he's done with younger players, which is wildly unfair. Come on. This guy's won in this league. He knows what he's doing. Has he had some rigidity? Sure. Is there things that I could be, would like to see a little bit better with the team offensively? Absolutely. But he's a good defensive coach and he gets a lot out of his team. And he's, I don't think he's an idiot. I think he knows a little bit about what he's doing and how to put players in the right positions to succeed. I'll say, I think in regardless of your walk of life, the more success you have, the harder it becomes to admit that you might be wrong or you might not know everything or that there might be a better way or a different way that is worth doing. And again, I don't think that's just something with NBA coaches. I think that's, yeah. you could point to literally any profession. I mean, geez, look, look at Russell Westbrook right now. I mean, talk right. about a guy who's having trouble admitting like, you know, this, because it's worked for me before, it can't work now. Again, that's neither here nor there. So I, I think there, that there is a certain amount of fairness to, again, critiquing Tibbs from that specific angle where, where I, where it gets under my, and this is maybe just something personally, we've, me and Andrew have talked about it a lot on and offline is like the, the blatant, like this is, this man is like stupid or like this person yeah. should not have a job because like how, how it is so obvious, like X, Y, Z, like how could you not see it? Like we, we, I know everybody gets on him when he's like, I watch the games and like, you don't like, but he does have access to a lot of information that we don't. He does live this every day. There are things that he sees and hears and experiences that are just, you know, to say nothing of all the other stuff. They're like, hey, you know, hindsight's always going to be 2020. And that's why it's so hard to be a coach. Because if your team loses a game, you could always point to something where it's like, oh, well, it this alternative outcome could have had, could have had a different, you know, or alternative decision could have had a different outcome. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm with you. Dexter, yeah. you, you just got a, a snapshot of a lot of conversations we had last year. Oh, it's a lot. Really? Okay. Yes. A lot. So a lot, where John a lot, a lot. passionately defended the head coach. Now we had the dust has settled a bit. We're in it's in the past. We're all in year year three of this and quite enjoying watching the Knicks play basketball, to be completely honest. Yeah. Um, and and that's the thing. I hope we I hope fans can just enjoy watching the team. Enjoy I, seems fun. I, I, think I try do. to, yeah. I tr as I get older, I try to enjoy the journeys more with the teams that I watch. Just like not, listen, we all want them to win, but enjoy the process. And sometimes there's something about enjoying the process of seeing a, a team of homegrown players grow or play basketball in a fun, but right way, you know, whatever that means to you in terms of the basketball you like to watch. But I think that that matters for sure. All I will say in not in defense of the, Tibbs is stupid hive because I was never part of it, but <laughs> I listened to all of it and read a lot of it because it's part of my job. Um, the John mentioned the the floor being as high as it possibly could be with Tibbs, which is yep. something I also respect. And it's why I, was, I never got as far as like fire him. And I more got on the front office for being like, listen, dude, your job is safe. We're not going anywhere this season. Please stop starting Alec Burks at point guard. Let's see what the ceiling yeah. is on an Emmanuel quickly during the rest of the season. That's like, fair. I think that was a fair criticism. I and think I criticize him for the that. reigning yeah. in of Obi Toppin, that, or the reigning yep. of Julius Randle that never happened. Let's see what Obi Toppin is. Yep. And there's this one moment for Tibbs last year after the comeback win in Miami, where yep. he was like, you guys don't watch what I watch. You guys don't like pay attention to that I do. And while some might have been like, see, tell him Tibbs, what he did in that game what was was what everybody was asking for all season. Play Emmanuel quickly more. Play, Jer yeah. uh, play Jericho Sims more. Play Obi Toppin more. Play the kids. And the kids let a comeback win against a one seed that was trying to be the one seed. Yeah. Yes. So it felt condescending, which had led to the back and forth throughout the year. And I, I think Tibbs is a bad coach. Absolutely not. He should deserve the respect for a coach that has accomplished what he has. I personally give him credit for Doc Rivers' career and the success that he's continued to get because I think he was largely responsible oh, for the 2008 champion. How many more super teams is he going to not win a title with, John? Anyway, that's, that's 
Anyway, um, all that being said, I personally was like, can we get a mandate from the front office or some input from the front office that like we'd like to pivot? And that's why I thought you saw Jericho Sims play a lot more in the second half. It's why you saw oh, we start to play a little more and Julius have some healthy. Uh, he, he was out with an injury. Fine. But like, I think he probably could have played had the games mattered down the stretch. They wanted to see what Obi Toppin was, which I think is what the fan base was starting to see. It was less about like we need to win every game possible like the we here season. Let's actually see what these players are because we don't know what their ceilings are. I was and I was fine with that when I talked to fans about that. I was totally fine with that. And I did think there was a point in the season where it was like, okay, come on, you you need to play some of the kids, right? Like I was, I was there, um, you know, when it was like the last 20 games of the season, you clearly were not going anywhere. I, now he played him in the final, he played him a lot in the final, what was it? Seven, eight games. It was the last 11 games. 11 they games. They went so. seven and four. Yeah. Uh, what I've liked to have seen is some more, a more, a, a bigger sample size. Absolutely. I'm, I'm fine with that. There were people who I talked to some Knicks fans and they'd be like, well, he we should have been playing quickly in the start of the season. And, you know, and I was like, that was never going to happen, man. Well, they had signed Kemba Walker. Yeah. Signed Fournier. Now there's a fair point. If you want to tell me that, look, you saw from the jump, it was not going to work. And the, the backcourt was terrible defensively. I hear you, but you know how these things go, guys. Once the front office has made a signing and all this stuff, they don't want the egg on their face. Now, should they? That's another argument. That's a totally another argument, right? Sometimes you have a sunk cost. You need to just let it go and say, all right, this didn't work out here. A lot of, a lot of organizations and teams, this isn't even just sports, do, never do that, right? Sometimes, here's, here's the thing, and this kind of gets back to the cam high. The point I will agree with the cam hive on is, look, you gave a first round pick for this guy. Yeah. At some point, I need to see what he can do. That's fair. I have no Mm -hmm. problem with that. Now we're getting to see what he can do. And I am very intrigued. I'm going to be thinking about Jonathan from like every Nick game here on and what he says, because if he continues to play well and Grimes is out for a little bit of extended period of time, it really is interesting what they do. It is... One of a few elephants in the room. Um, yeah. Obi and Julius is another one. That's a, I think that's a big one. Do you guys want more time for Obi? And if so, how much more time and how does that work? That's the, that's the thing I want to know from you. John, your answer, please. <laughs> I would like more time for Obi Toppin. I, I think it wouldn't kill Tibbs to play them a couple minutes a game together. Um, yeah. I think, but again, that gets back to the floor ceiling thing. And again, you, you look at, what he does when he has a true rim protector. But then you ask the question, like might Obi be able to fill that role? You know, it, it, you, there's always a rabbit hole. You could fall down with this stuff, but yeah, I think he should play more. I absolutely uh-huh. think he should play more. I thought he could have played four, you know, three, four minute, more minutes last night. And even as I say that you go back and you look what happened. Like there was a tight game in the fourth quarter. They took Obi out less than a minute later. Julius Randle hits a big three pointer. Like might you know, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's a tough situation that developed because they did not know that they had a guy in Julius Randle that was going to turn into what he turned into when they drafted Obi Toppin. And here we are three years or whatever it is, two, two and a half years later. Yes, later. I echo a lot of what John says about Obi. Although, so to fill you more in, we we have a running bet. We like there are wagers on Obi Toppin's minutes this year. <laughs> oh, this um, is fun. <laughs> so yes. we have a, I think it's a drink of choice yeah. that, that, uh, they will play less than 100 minutes this year if they if together, they, if, 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 together, together on the court together. together. Yeah. Okay, so the court. I took okay. the under. John took the over. They played 101 last season, so I only oh. have 101 to go. Yes, you have 101 minutes. <laughs> yes, yes, you, yes, three games in, you only have 101 to go. <laughs> My take on through three games, I don't yeah. think they're two and one, and potentially an Evan Fournier three away from having a chance at three and zero oh without the exact minute rotations that Tibbs has done so far. So I commend him for that. Yeah. If I didn't care about the record, yeah, I'd be like, I want to see more Obi minutes. I want to see what the eighth pick in the draft two years ago, what he is with 25 minutes a game, or how about this 20 minutes a game, but they're two and one largely because of the rotation patterns that we've seen so far. So I can't, I can't knock it, you know? Yeah. I'm, Okay, I'm with, I'm I'm with you guys on that. Well, I, I'm kind of with Jonathan on the fact of well, both of you guys. I, I, if they if you want to see more minutes for Obi, which I wouldn't mind seeing, let's see some with them together. And I do think there's some teams they can do this against. And one of the teams sure. I think is one of the teams I think it actually is coming up uh, on Wednesday in Charlotte. I think that's a team where you can go a little bit smaller, and you can run with that team 
and the way they even want to play a little bit faster. I would like, I think that's the thing I'd like to see. Will Tibbs experiment with more lineups for different scenarios during the season, right? Like that. Let's see Obi at the five and Julius at the four and see what they can do together. Just try it. Even if it's four, even if it's four minutes for one game, like let's see it. Like it'll be nice to see it. Let, let's uh, let's finish up with this. What, what do you think? I don't want to ask you for like a record or a seed or anything like that, but like mm-hmm. six months from now, whatever, April, May, do you think this next season will leave a la- overwhelmingly positive taste in the mouths of most, most fans, or do you, do you think it will be a mixed bag or do you think it will be in the, in the negative? It won't be positive for the fans that uh, want to see Obi top and play more minutes. Probably not. But, <laughs> no, but no, seriously. Um, I think it'll be overwhelmingly positive. I actually, <laughs> I do. I, I, I think that, I think that Knicks fans are going to come out of this season and I think they're going to be very impressed continuously about what they see from Jalen Brunson. I think they're going to see what we've already seen, which is Julius Randle more in the role that works for him, where he doesn't have to handle the ball as much. And I think they're going to see some cohesiveness. I have this, I haven't said this publicly yet, so I'm saying Ooh, it now. There we go. I'm saying it. I think the Knicks are going to be a bit better than even what I think the most level-headed Nick fans are projecting them for. A lot of people have said 42 to 44 wins, which I generally agree with. And I think you said the same when you came on with me, Mac. Um, I think they might do a little bit better. I think they're... Wow. Want to put a number on it? <sighs> you said better than 42 to 44. Yeah, I want to say, I wanna say 46. Oh! I'm going to go with 46. Yeah. I'm gonna go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 45 oh. win predictor at the beginning yeah, go, before the season. I'm going with 46. Right there with you. I, there's something. I, the, one of the things I see, and I know it's early, but the thing I keep coming back to this: the thing that I'm liking, the defensive intensity is there. Um, I think they're 10th and 11th in adjusted defensive rating right now. I think it's 11th in adjusted defensive rating right now. The offense looks good because of the efficiency of the offense. And I think the ball movement is real. The way these guys are buying in is real. That's something I think to keep an eye on as they get into tight situations and games, how that works. Do they still buy into it? If that's sustainable, guys, I think you might come out and say, hey, this is a really good team that plays cohesively together. I think if the Knicks fan sees that at the end of the season, it's been a good season. If they are... You know, 46 wins. I know I'm saying it, Andrew, and I see you smiling at the 45, and we had Jonathan lean all the way back. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm j- that sounds that sounds like he should be in the playoffs and avoiding yeah. the play in, right? They'll, if they win 46 games, I believe they will be a playoff team, not a play-in team. The reason why I lean back and the reason why I still continue to have my, my doubts is I want to see... I think the defense is really solid, and I think the defense is, is really good. I want to see how if the offense an offense that as we've talked about already just does not have a lot of shooting. It does not have a lot of reliable shooting. That's a concern. That is a fact. It is just, it is what it is. Maybe that changes significantly when Grimes comes back. Maybe, maybe the reddish, you know, I, I tweeted it today. He's, I mean, small sample, but he's three of seven or four, no, four of seven, excuse me, four on, seven. Uh, on catch and mm-hmm. shoot threes. Like yep. maybe they, they keep getting the, RJ. Hopefully he keeps making threes. Um, I, that's, I'm I'm worried about whether they're going to be able to score enough against really really top end teams. I that's my big concern. That's why I'm more in the 40 to 42, 43 win range. But I, I would love nothing more. Oh yeah, you lo- you, you love you love those. Hey, listen, I think it. I think I don't know. We got to roll, but I think that the shot making will matter. It's really what did him in in the Memphis game. The, the slow start to the game, and obviously the poor percentage they shot from downtown in that game. Um, I believe it was 27%. But if the shot making is better, if IQ starts to heat up from downtown, you see Reddish and RJ, two guys you just mentioned there, Grimes, obviously we think that he can be a shot maker and comes back and does that. And that is going along with the ball movement. I just think that's only going to build confidence. The one thing I do, that's why I really like ball movement. If you're still keeping up the ball movement, even when you're not hitting shots, I think it yes. bodes well for when it turns that you are hitting shots and it builds confidence among the team and playing. And I agree with you, Jonathan. They're playing the right. They're playing the defense. I'm not worried about. I'm um, not worried not about at it all. all. Yeah. They're playing good defense early. I, Julius looks engaged. Even Evan Fournier looks engaged on some possessions, and we haven't seen that in a while. So that's really good. But if the ball movement keeps up and they're playing with this faster pace, 
I think he could bowl well. And that's where you start to catch a couple of teams and you, you win some games you're not supposed to maybe. And I think that's how you can get to 45, 46 wins. Look, Andrew and I are probably dreaming. Andrew's no, over, no, Andrew's fight over the here good smiling. fight. These naysayers fight the good over fight. here. Okay. You got Andrew, Andrew, Andrew smiling. You know, I just, you know, I just want to see the Knicks fans smile again and be happy. I, I, I want to see them be happy, man. That's 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 all I want to see. Yeah. I, I why like do you happy. hate the Knicks, John? <laughs> <laughs> please, please title that. Uh, that's this episode. Ben. This episode. Why do you um, hate the Knicks, John? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Henry. You are awesome. We will do this again. Um, yeah, man. Before before I let you go, can you please let the folks at home know where they could find you and uh, yes. and any any of your stuff? Yeah. Uh, D Henry TV. That's the handle for Twitter. Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and putting some content on TikTok lately. Got late to the TikTok game, Love but it, I'm so there. Um, you can you can follow my show, the NBA Exchange. Uh, we do that Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays. Might be switching the time on that. So stay tuned on that. And uh, also Ain't Hard to Tell podcast, my sports and hip hop podcast I do with my man, Brian Fonseca. Uh, you can follow and check that out, too. It's on all streaming platforms. And you can watch me um, on the New York Post YouTube channel or SNY YouTube channel um, there on Saturday, Sundays and also Tuesdays during the week. Uh, so check it out. Jonathan will be back on for sure because I like to bring my independent content creators, especially to talk mixed basketball. We we're trying to, we're trying to make it more diverse. I told you, Jonathan, more diverse voices yes. around the Knicks that come on and talk. And obviously you're, you guys are both intelligent guys that cover the Knicks and break down the film and all the other stuff. No, 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 no. You guys uh, are intelligent. You're, you guys, are, you guys are smart guys. And you know, I like that. And so listen, I'm a die. I grew up a diehard Knicks fan. Still love the Knicks. Anytime you guys want me back, I am more than welcome to come on and talk Knicks basketball anytime, man. You you could count on it. We'll have you uh, back on later in the season so we could, uh, you know, talk about all the things that we got wrong on this episode. <laughs> and, and, uh, what do you mean, we? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew's like, there's no we in this. It's just yeah. me. There you go. Uh, this is great. Uh, Dexter Henry, thank you so much. Thanks, guys.